So the day that I launched it back in March, I think it was March the 27th, 2017, Tim Ferriss was number one, I was number two, and Gary Vee was number three. I was like, oh, that worked out quite well. And then from that point onwards, I was like, then I then I launched a, a podcast for my coaching business, the one that did seven figures, and that went into the iTunes top charts as well. I was like, oh, this works, doesn't it? So I sort of systemized it and tweaked the process. And now fast forward to today, I've launched 129 podcasts for clients with 85 to 90% of them going into the iTunes top chart. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets, the podcast where we pull back the curtain on what it takes to be a seven figure entrepreneur. In each episode, I will dissect the wisdom, the experiences and the strategies of entrepreneurs who are achieving amazing levels of success today. So you can learn quicker and easier than even they did. I'm on an absolute mission to show the world and the next generation of entrepreneurs that wealth isn't just about a number in the bank account. It's about earning your freedom. It's about having the power to make real change in the world. And it's about proving to yourself what you're capable of. My name is Bethan Jepson, and in this series, I will bring you amazing guests to reveal their millionaire business and lifestyle secrets. If you are a business owner looking to grow beyond six and seven figures, then I invite you to check out my website, bethanjepson.com, where we have a bunch of free resources that should help you, including a 60-day launch checklist that you can download straight away. Um, also access to a network of other driven entrepreneurs called the Success Circle. And I also have the opportunity for you to speak to me. If you want to talk strategy or growth, then I would be honored to have a call with you and hear all about you and your business. For now, I want to welcome you to episode number 18 of Millionaire Secrets. This week's guest was absolutely brilliant. And I have no doubt that this will become one of the most listened to episodes because his skill set is super in demand. James Burt is the podcast king and is one of the UK's leading experts on launching a podcast. Having launched 100 plus podcasts for clients, 85% of these have made it into the iTunes top 50 podcast charts. James is also a certified performance coach and an in-demand media trainer. His love of radio and broadcast started 14 years ago when he ventured into the world of broadcast PR, which led to him working with some of the world's biggest household name brands and eventually led to him becoming a radio presenter. James is also an international keynote speaker who has shared the stage with the likes of Les Brown, Eddie the Eagle Edwards, and via his own shows, global influencer Grant Cardone, Elena Cardone, trunky inventor Rob Law, MBE, global fitness influencer James Alderton, and a ton of other leading industry figures. I think one of the most valuable takeaways that I certainly took away from this interview was the importance of your network. And you'll hear how well-networked James is in this episode. We would both love to hear your key takeaways, so please feel free to share these on social and tag us both in. You'll find all our social media info in the show notes. Enjoy this episode. Wonderful. We're now live. Welcome to Millionaire Secrets, James. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I'm sorry. We should have done this last week. My mates moved back from America. I had to help them move in under COVID restrictions, which is all a bit weird. But yeah, yes, I'm not thank sure you. I'm answering that. <laughs> I, I, yeah, but I, saw, I had a mask on. I kept away from them and just poked them with a sharp stick when they tried to hug me. Like, I haven't seen you for five years. Like, Get away from me. You might have the Rona. But yeah, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Standard social interaction these days, isn't it? So weird, isn't it? It's so weird. <laughs> Oh, okay, so as our listeners will know, we always start off with with some rapid fire questions. So, yeah, I love a quick fire round. I love <laughs> a quick fire round. People are always a bit surprised by my quick fire round, and you might see why in a second. But okay, because yeah. <laughs> it's I'm I'm pretty direct. So <laughs> okay, well, wow. brace yourself. <laughs> okay, so James, let's start off by asking, where do you live? I live in Chislehurst, uh, which is South East London slash North Kent, depends on who you ask. Okay. And where did you grow up? I grew up in a place called Sear Green, which was a little village out in Buckinghamshire. Oh, nice. What was your first job and what, what did it teach you? 
Oh, this is great. I'm loving this already. This is like <laughs> cathartic therapy. Uh, my first job, I was 13 years old and I had a job at a local golf club. Oh. And I had the world's coolest job for a 13 year old because my job was on the summer evenings to go to the golf club and to get into this little golf buggy and drive around the driving range and collect the balls up. So if you've ever been to like a driving range, you know there's a little geek in the in the car and everyone tries to like subconsciously tries to hit the guy in the little buggy. That was me. But I was 13 years old and I used to listen to like Speed Garage and drive around with this buggy with one hand, smoking a Benson Hedges fag, thought <laughs> I was made. And on top of all that, it gets even better. I was earning £5.50 an hour, which in 19... 19- 96 was like baller money so i was the guy who could afford the cigarettes and the ciders and to go out and to go to like the i got to london to go and do stuff i could buy stuff for my mates so yeah that was my first job and it taught me it taught me how to interact with people basically because this it was um it's called beaconsfield golf club it's very very posh and i used to get lots of business um outside of my greenkeeping hours from the old posh members who wanted me to go and cut their grass and I charged I remember there's this old boy came up to me he said how much do you charge to to do a lawn I said well I've never done one before he said well 20 pounds seems about reasonable how's that sound to you young man and and 20 quid in 1996 as a 13 year old was like mega dough <laughs> mega dough um and he was a lovely old boy as well so I used to go to his house he and his, uh, his elderly wife they always used to make me a cup of tea when I turned up they make me a bacon sandwich when I got to half the garden because it was like ground so I do half and half um and he smoked well, so we'd sit there and we'd have a cigarette and a cup of tea and talk about life um so yeah that's probably what I learned uh, yeah. most was the the power of communicating with people I'd say amazing also that's just made me realize how underpaid i was as a 16 year old at kfc making four pounds an hour in like 2010 or whatever it it was um did you have a role model or mentor that inspired you to start your first business i know it it sounds like that that gentleman was who asked you to cut his lawn was kind of your (laughs) the first person but was there any like intentional intentional role models or mentors that you had (sighs) Do you know what? Subconsciously, I suppose my dad was. So my dad ran quite a successful little accountancy company. It was his. He, he had it with um, two other business partners. And I went through that like angsty teenage, you know, like 13 to 17. And I was just a bit of an arsehole, frankly. Sorry if I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this one. I've said it now. You have yeah. to leave that out. Um, <laughs> and and I, yeah, I wasn't a very nice kid from 13 to 17. And, and I like, and I put a lot of my own, uh, I guess, issues or challenges down to like my mum and dad. I remember saying to my dad, and I still regret it to this day. And sadly, he's no longer here, so I wish I could say sorry to him even more. But I said, I, I said, I hope I never turn out like you. And I was like, I hate you. I hope you know that sort of. I hate you. You don't understand me. I hope I never turn out like you. But now, as a dad, as a business owner, he had you know twenty staff, twenty five staff, something like that. Brought home good money. We never wanted for anything. Now, as a business owner and a dad myself, I was like, actually, I could be, I could do a lot worse than have him as my role model. And as I say, unfortunately, I lost him ten years ago now when I was twenty six. So I never got to be like a proper, I wasn't really a proper grown up at 26. I didn't have children. I didn't have any responsibilities. I've been a holiday rep and a singer in a band and all this kind of stuff. So I never really got to be a grown up and have grown up conversations with him. But actually, mm-hmm. I think subconsciously just seeing him run a business was kind of, uh, yeah, subconscious mentoring. Mm-hmm. And if I look at it now, he's definitely, he used to be the person I'd turn to for any question or query that I had. So yeah, definitely my dad. Even though at the time I would have gone, oh, you don't know nothing. But it actually turns out he's quite wise. Oh, yeah. Isn't it? Isn't it funny how, well, I don't know what we can talk about later perhaps, but I feel like you reach a certain age and it's like you all of a sudden get a new appreciation for oh, <laughs> your parents. 100%. 100%. <laughs> uh, um, what time do you get up in the morning and what's the first thing that you do? Oh, right. So at the moment, I get up whenever one of my children wakes me up, which is generally between sort of five o'clock and six o'clock in the morning. And the first thing that I do is take them downstairs and make them breakfast. Um, I've tried to stay off my phone. I used to be a big proponent of the 5M. I love getting up early and not because it's like 5M. Like, oh, get up at five because you're a geezer. But I just I just like the quiet of five o'clock. Again, for, maybe it goes back to my, you know, like golf course days. I used to get up at half past four and the sun used to come up and the birds would be singing. It just gives you space to think. And I'm quite, um, I'm quite active. I'm big on like taking action, like the law of attraction, I get. Mm-hmm. But the law of action, I think is even more impactful and powerful. So I'm a guy who does a lot of stuff. So to have that quiet time in the morning from five 
to get up and go to the gym or go for a run or whether you you know I, I go through spells of being into meditation or into reading or into journaling so to have that quiet time so normally I'd like to get up at five but we just had a, a baby uh, who wakes up at anything between sort of like half two and four o'clock for feeding in the night so I'm definitely not getting up at five at the moment so <laughs> normally during normal uh, proceedings five o'clock and the first thing I do would be probably to go and train, go to the gym or go for a run. But at the moment, yeah, about half six. And the first thing I do is make a bowl of Wheatos. <laughs> Amazing. Very specific. Um, what what works better for you? And you can interpret this question any way you like. Intensity or consistency? Oh, Oh, God, she's gone in strong early. Um, <laughs> intensity or consistency? Oh, I mean, I've had spells of, of successes that have come from both, frankly. I, and I think you kind of got to balance the two. You have to have a level of intensity, but if you don't do it consistently, then it's, it's just a non-starter. Um, I would say overall, it's got to be consistency. Okay. Be because if even if you're doing something... You know, you could do something at one hundred percent focus for a month if it doesn't get the results. But if you carry on, month, you know, you could do it at fifty percent for months one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, it's a difficult one for me to answer that because when I've had real spikes of success, whether it be financial or for business, there have been intense periods and they have been consistent. Um, did they result in long term happiness? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I know this is quick fire, and I'm really not answering them in a quick fire way. But <laughs> tough luck, you can't force me to. So I'd say, I'd say overall, it's got to be consistency but there has to be in, in intensity to your consistency. Mm. Yeah, it's, that's actually one of the new, a new question I've introduced. And it's horrible. It's, it's horrible, but <laughs> brilliant. Include it forever, but it's because right now I'm really kind of studying these kind of contradictions in business or like like two, ex or two like, yeah, like not necessarily extremes, but two like opposite ends of the opposites, system. yeah, yeah. And like, is there a is there a balance between some of these core things yeah. and the in intensity consistency thing was just something that came up recently so i just wanted to i've, I've I literally just before we jumped on i was looking at linkedin and there's a guy who i really like dominic oh what's called i think dominic mcgregor oh yeah he used, to be, he he used to be the ceo at um, social chain social or still chain. is the ceo at yeah. social chain and he said this whole like you got to work hard mentality is just nonsense and i'm like I get it from a psychological perspective and I get it from a mental health perspective and I get it from an overall health perspective. But mm. equally, there's got to, I, I think life is seasonal. You can't go, oh, you know, people are like, oh, I'm going all in. You're not going all in. Because if you're doing all in at one thing, like you're not taking time for your family or whatever. But I think there are seasons where you have to increase the intensity. There are then seasons where you need to pull back. There are seasons for the, the, the next stage of it. But I think you need to, be con maybe even the consistency part of that question is that you you're consistent in your understanding of it being seasonal so mm. you've got to be you know intense with i'm intense with my work from monday to friday then i'm intense with my family saturday that's a weird analogy like i'm gonna be intensely fathering you today we're gonna go <laughs> intensely play in the park but that's kind of like the way that you i think you have to operate but it's definitely a balancing act great question good. great question i'm glad you enjoyed that one <laughs> i didn't enjoy it but i think it's a good question <laughs> Uh, what's your what's your next big goal uh my next big goal is to do a million pounds in revenue in a business that i solely own okay. so i've done a million quid in revenue for a business i was a co-founder of but i want to do it by myself mm, interesting um yeah i'm kind of i'm recently having a a similar thought pattern but the other way so maybe we can talk about that in a bit <laughs> okay polar opposites again i like it <laughs> what's the bravest thing you've ever done uh bravest thing i donated a kidney that was quite brave wow. i guess um so that's one but i suppose yeah so that that from a physical perspective was probably the bravest thing i've ever done from an emotional and psychological perspective i walked away from a seven figure business this time last year okay and that was very uh a very interesting emotional journey because it's very easy to you know to move on to the next thing or to pivot oh, word of 2020 um <laughs> to pivot when things aren't working it's a very 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 strange and i've, and I've had a lot of stuff that hasn't worked and i'll be like well i'll do this next i'll do this next i'll do this next but to have something that was working and made me money um you know the first year of, the, of that particular business i made one hundred seventeen thousand pounds take home 
year one. I've never done six figures before. And I was like, oh my God. I thought I was balling out at £5.50 as a golf course owner. So when you get to like 120 grand cash in your bank, I was like, oh, I've done, I've done all right here. So to walk away from that was a big choice and a big decision. And mm-hmm. I think it's taken me this year to to kind of find my feet with my thought process with it, frankly, because it was, that was a big decision. So yeah, one of kidney or walking away from a million quid business, both of which sound really stupid. <laughs> no, well, both of which it sounds like there's a really interesting story behind them. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, definitely something we'll be talking about. <laughs> you can choose which one we talk about first. <laughs> kidney, definitely kidney. <laughs> definitely not the business. <laughs> oh dear. What's your What's your biggest fear? My only fear is fear of fear itself. Um, <laughs> no. Um, my fear, I would say at the moment, is being able to emulate the success that I recently had by myself. I'm, I'm really having a bit of a... I did a Facebook Live video about it today because all of my friends are like, oh, it's Mr. Motivator, Mr. Positive. And I was like, this way, I've had a real lull this week. I've been really like with the agency. I've been running an agency since since June time. Took off like wildfire. I've had some clients leave this month because of COVID has had an effect on their business and all the rest of it. There's some stuff that I probably hadn't managed properly. Um, there's yeah, just a lot of and I've had a real slump the whole week to the point where yesterday I was I was really I don't ever say to I don't often say I feel low, but yesterday I felt low to the point where I went and had lunch with, you know, I'm working at home, I went downstairs and had lunch. And I felt that low that for no reason, I was like, I think I'm going to cry. And I was like, I don't want my son to see how my energy was just bad. And I could tell I was bringing everyone down. So I took my lunch. I came and sat up here in this office on my own mm. for an hour. And I just sat and flipped the lip, lip, laptop lid shut and just sat. And I was like, what am I doing? Um, so yeah, and I think part of that, and I mentioned it, you know, a minute ago, that this sort of like this working out of walking away from a seven-figure business, I did it, I did it for the right reasons, but that's taken me a long time. You know, the, the most the, the time in my life I've ever made the most money was with those business partners in that business. So I'm now going, can you do it again by yourself? Mm. You know, to go from a standing start to seven figures in eighteen months is pretty spectacular, especially when the three of us collectively had very little business acumen, frankly, and we're a little bit Neanderthal in our thinking. So to be to now go right, okay, you've stepped away from that, you've punted yourself as the person who could do it by yourself, prove it. So mm. I think I'm yeah, I'm having a, a bit of a that would I'd say would be my biggest business fear. But obviously, you know, as a as a parent, you're you're your main concern is the health and safety of your children. So like that kind of, but I don't even, I don't even think in that realm because if I start going down there, they're like, I'll I'll unravel. So um, yeah. So either kid safety or making money. (laughs) And everyone's going, this guy sounds great and like an arsehole at the same time. I'm not sure whether I like him or not. I don't, I think I probably don't. (laughs) That's okay. You're giving us, you're giving us several options for each question. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) And what has been the best, day in your entire entrepreneurial career in my entrepreneurial career oh sounds like a weird one because i've i've interviewed like grant cardone elena cardone i've done i've done um we used to sponsor some athletes we took elena cardone to like an east london boxing fight a bethnal green and um, grant cardone is like a pal of mine now um, which is a bit weird. I've spoke on stage with Les Brown and all these like amazing accolades. I've done. I remember doing my first six-figure month, then six-figure week, then six-figure day in that previous business. Those uh-huh. were all, all pretty spectacular. But you know what? I would say the again because it was the money that I because I'd made the decision, stepped away, and done my own thing. The the day where I made the first money through my latest company, the Ultimate Podcast Group, I'll never forget it. I made 150 quid. Um, for doing an intro and an outro package. And when that money landed into my own business bank, which only my name was on, which only my name is on at Company's House, that was probably I, I, the way that I felt and the way that I acted was like it was 150 grand, not 150 singular pounds. Mm-hmm. And that's when I knew that I was really on the right path. So I'd say, yeah, either speaking at Les Brown or interview Grant Cardone or make it 150 quid. <laughs> I'll give you some options again. <laughs> Oh, love it. What has been the worst day? 
Oh, the worst day from a business perspective. It's probably the day that I left the other business that I was involved in recently. Because because uh, it's a really weird one. The the people that I worked with, and I've got to be very careful about what I say for le for legal reasons. But the people that I worked with had had were, were like a family at one point. We were we were like brothers. We mm -hmm. we really really had each other's backs. We supported each other. Again, you know, we were like three Neanderthal geezers who had made a business that went from a standing start to eight uh, to seven figures. None of us, we all changed our lives. We all moved to different houses. We bought, you know, cars and watches and we changed our lifestyles. And there was manor houses. And, you know, I, I live, now live in a five bed detached with, you know, I always wanted to be the family that had two Audis. And I've now got two Audis on the driveway and all that stuff. But all that, all that sort of physical, tangible stuff was great. But we had a real strong bond. We were real, real, we were family. I wouldn't say we were friends, we were family. And like family, some days you hate them, but you always have a, a sort of a, an underlying love for them. And the day that I decided that I had to go was really difficult because I knew that not only was I going to step away from this business, not only was I going to step away from, you know, this shareholding of a seven figure company, of which I was going to get paid zero for building this brand, I was also going to lose my two mates. Um, and I knew because of who they were and what they were like, I knew that was the fact. So I knew that was the case. And despite how much I liked them at the time um, for who they were, I knew I was going to lose them. So that was probably the, the toughest thing because I'll never forget it. We were supposed to go for this business meeting up north on the Thursday of this particular week. But we were going to travel up on the Tuesday night. So we were ready for the because it was a big, big meeting. So we were going to be there for, you know, travel up on the Tuesday night. So we were there all day Wednesday. So we were prepped to go there early on the Thursday. And I was like, I just can't go. I can't, I can't go up in the car. I can't go. But I wanted to tell them face to face. I wanted to say, look, I'm, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. We'd already had the conversation about I might go. Um, and I, and they'd kind of taught me around to not go in. So yeah, that that Monday morning, I was like, I'm just gonna have to make the phone call. So I did. I had to do it over the phone. So I've never I've never looked them in the eyes again since I left. Wow. Which I really wanted to, even though again, basically on who they are, doing it face to face was probably um, a risk to my mental and physical well being. But I was like, I've got to do I've got to do that. I've got to look them in the eyes and tell them that I'm going, mm. and hug them or try and shake their hand or try and leave it the right way. But just the diaries didn't allow for it. So I was like, I'm going to have to make this call on the Monday morning. So I did. It was it was seven minutes past nine on on this particular day. And I phoned up and I phoned them. They, they, they were brothers. So I phoned up the order of sort of love that I had. Like one I got on better with than the other. So I phoned the one that I liked more first because I knew he'd give me a bit of an easier ride. So, yeah, that was probably the most difficult day because I knew what I was going to have to walk away from in, in every sense of the word. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, These yeah. are not quick fire answers. I appreciate. <laughs> I like your quick fire round. I'm sorry that it's taken 17 hours to get through it. <laughs> Don't worry. Like you're not the first that you know. That... And I won't be the last. The thing is, it opens like a can of worms. Like this, this is it pulls out all the interest. I, I feel emotion. I feel emotionally drained. <laughs> Honestly, I feel. I feel like I need a lie down. I did warn you. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I know, but. Well, I didn't expect you know, people like, oh, this is going to take you, you know, put you through your pace. I'm like, okay, yeah, I've done, I've done thousands of podcast episodes, I've done millions of downloads. I'm cool. You can ask me anything, but now, like Bethan's come out and just like shot me in the heart. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. It's fine. I'm enjoying it. I'm not enjoying it, but I'm liking it. It's good. For, it's good for me. It's not nice, but it's good for me. We're all. You'll be pleased to know we're almost done. Thank God for that. <laughs> This is a question that is um, unique for you based on your skill set. Um, I would love it if you could share with our listeners a top tip for growing a brand or your brand. Top tip for growing a brand. So I would say the top tip for you growing your brand has got to be know why you're doing it. There's okay. so many people who start to build a brand because, again, because this is popularized now. I started off in the branding, marketing, PR game in 2006. You know, there wasn't social media. People didn't do branding apart from like celebrities, influencers, people on the telly. Uh, but now everyone, because of social media, everyone is building a personal brand as well as a business brand. But I would say, yeah, the first thing you need to understand is why are you building that brand? Mm. No, don't be don't do a podcast for the sake of it don't have an instagram for the sake of it don't have you know unless it's for, you know, for friends and family but even if you're posted just for friends and family that still is building your brand consciously or subconsciously that is saying something about you which is building your brand so yeah number one tip know why you're doing it know why you're doing it before you start great yeah that's a great tip um 
And the final question of the quick fire round that has been more of a medium fire round. <laughs> it's been a slow fire round. It feels like it's, time has gone backwards fire round. <laughs> well, the last question is, um, so this is, this uh, kind of speaks to my ethos and, and this is um, a concept that is my personal motivation. Um, and yeah, and it's yeah, it's based on there uh, as everything is our traumatic childhood experiences. Um, <laughs> but I have a, a concept which I call success without sacrifice. And it's just, it's the thing that drives me. It's what I'm working towards. And um, yeah, similarly, it's what my clients come to me for. So I just love to know like what that means to you. Like what is your version of success without sacrifice? What, what, what I think that means to me. Yeah. Well, how do you interpret that for yourself? I, I think I, I love the concept. I love the ethos. I'm going to maybe a bit sort of, uh, in opposition here, I, I think it's very, very difficult to have a level of success without sacrifice. I really do. I'm, I'm happy to watch your journey and to be proved wrong, but I think you always have to sacrifice. It depends how you frame sacrifice, though, doesn't it? So, for example, I get out of bed at five normally when I'm not on the Weto's run. I get out of bed at five o'clock in the morning, but I love doing it. I don't think it's a sacrifice, but I am sacrificing my sleep. So, again, mm. I guess ultimately, you know, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so, as Shakespeare said, you know, four or five hundred years ago. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I think to get a level of success in anything, you're going to have to sacrifice something else. You know, with, for every for every challenge, there is an opportunity for every push. There is a pull for every yin. There is a yang for every dark. There is a light. I think there's always opposing things at play. So I think you can't have huge levels of success without sacrifice. But again, that depends on what your definition of success is. If success is happiness, you have to just spend your time trying to be happy, which ultimately is what everyone's trying to aspire to, whether it be like financially driven or emotionally driven or physically driven. Everyone's trying to be happier. So I don't know if I've got it in a giant circle here. I don't know what I don't. I love it. It's a bit of a riddle, Bethan, if I'm <laughs> honest. I love the concept of it, I, but I think you're always going to have to sacrifice something. But it depends on, like I say, I go running every day that's a sacrifice because i could spend time in the house with the kids in the morning but i sacrifice that time with the kids but i love doing it so i think you've got to find a way to frame the sacrifices as enjoyable or do them regardless of them being enjoyable mm -hmm. yeah i mean the reason that question i think is so interesting is because it, it yeah in order to answer it you have to consider what your version of success is as well Absolutely. as what your version of sacrifice is yeah and that is so different person to person so yeah i'll bet yeah, so it's, um, yeah, I just find it really interesting. <laughs> but okay, well, you can breathe a sigh of relief now, the uh, rapid fire. I can't because I know what's to come next. I feel like I need like a damp cloth just to cool <laughs> down. I should have had another cup of coffee. <sighs> okay, I'm ready though, I'm ready. It is a lot for a Friday afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, I, I actually want to explore a lot of the things you were saying around you know, in terms of the worst day, the worst day of your entrepreneurial career was when you had to leave your two friends, you know, behind or you decided to leave your two friends behind to go and pursue, I guess, what you're doing now. Yeah. And like I said to you before, like, it's interesting because, it, you know, you sound like you're, you're trying to, you're going from this group team situation and you're trying to build now on your own. And that's like, it sounds like, that's how you're measuring your value right now is like, can I do this on my own? The same thing that I could do in a group, like, can I do this on my own? And I just, I really resonate with that because I had a very, I've had a very similar experience, but I'm now like realizing uh, I don't actually like to do things on my own and I want to go back into a team situation. So I'm just curious to know, like, why do you want to be on your own? It's not that I want to be on my own. And I actually, I love, I'm a people person. I'm, you know, I'm a hugger. I'm a, I'm a person who likes to laugh with other people. I love bouncing ideas of other people. I'm very um, uh, emotionally uh, in touch with myself. I know what I'm great at. I know what I'm horrendous at. Um, so it's not a case that I want to do it by myself. I think I'm almost prove, I, I, I have, do have a need to prove that I could do it by myself this time round. Just because I've never, I've been, you know, I, I've, by the time I was 35, I think it was, I'd done 30 odd jobs. You know, I've been wow. a double glazing salesman. I've done this, you know, the green keeping. I worked in a hotel. Um, I was a holiday entertainer. I was a, a travel rep. I was a Michael Bublé tribute act. Um, I was, I've done all these things. I've worked in PR, blah, blah, blah. Done some stuff that for legal reasons I can't talk about. But um, for 
for all that stuff, um, I always thought like chopped and changed, but I always saw it as a bit like uh, it was it was something that I was a bit ashamed of, to be fair, mm-hmm. even to the point where my best man at my wedding was like, we all know that Bertie is really good at, you know, holding down a job and everyone, like 110 guests, like laugh their heads off. And I was like, oh, it feels a bit uncomfortable that. Yeah. But ultimately, I now look at that as uh, not as a badge of honour, but I, I'm an opportunist. I see an opportunity and I will go and chase the opportunity down. Mm. Um, so so that's the sort of the reframe that I've put on the sort of the, the, the chopping and changing. But I've done lots of stuff. You know, I've run um, I, I, I was going to start a property tech business and I took so long getting up and running that by the time that I, I had an amazing concept, it was genius. But by the time I rolled it out, right move had come along and kind of gazumped me and that's not that's not like oh well right move beat me to my idea i just i was too slow simple as that i've had a property management company i've had a music promotion company and i've 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 been all right i've made ends meet i've live a comfortable ish i have lived a comfortable ish life doing all of those things but i always aspire to have more Mm. and it was only with this previous company with the two business partners that the aspirations that I had for myself in terms of um, you know finances and material goods and status it was only in that previous company that those things came to fruition so now I feel like I have to do it maybe not by myself maybe for myself is okay. is, is the better way of doing it but by mm. by I'm, I'm under no illusion that I'm going to do it by myself no man is an island I'm not going to be at the moment I am the chief cook and bottle wash i'm yeah. doing the pr i'm doing the marketing i'm writing the blogs i'm doing the social media posts i'm doing the website i'm actually doing the production i've got some outsourcers who do graphic design audio production video production for me but again my my goal is to get on the business rather than in the business because even with the previous business where we've done the seven figures i was the engine of that business the other two brothers were the were the face of it they were the the celebrities of it okay. i was the engine of it Every mm-hmm. event, every course, every um, client, every booking, every payment. I did everything, every bit of travel. I, I organised the whole thing. I ran that business single-handedly. They turned up, were the megastars that they are, fucked off home. That was that was it. That was their role and that was my role. We, we all knew sort of where we stood. So I definitely feel the need to, yeah, I've, I guess I'm proving it to myself. But I, when I say I'm going to do it by myself, I think it's going to be my name above the door. Mm, okay, I understand. On its own. But I'm still going to have... You know, the first person I want to bring on board is a, is an audio producer. So as soon as the margins are big enough for the profit margins there, as soon as I get, you know, two months worth, three months worth of salary sat in the bank, I'm bringing somebody in. Mm. Because I've made that mistake before of trying to do everything by myself and not being able to. So I know that I need people around me. Great example. I had this this uh, client project came on board and I was like, do you know what? I need better audio. I'm quite good at audio production. I'm not amazing, but I'm quite good. I'll get I'll get away with it. Uh, but there's a guy who came to me who who wanted to work with me for ages. Like I followed you on social media for three years. I'd love to do some work with you. Here's some of my work, and he is bloody great. And I was like, he's better than me, and I know that. So as soon as this project came in, I said to him, right, I need you to come in and work with me on this project. And it worked a dream. So it's just a case now of going right. Let's go and find more of those sorts of clients where it's got that sort of margin in it, so I could bring him in more full time. So when I'm saying I want to do it. I want to do it for myself, not by myself. It's probably a better way of looking at it. Mm. So is that is that is that why you left then? Because you wanted to, it, you wanted it to be you on the door. Th- that that's how I dressed up. But no, it's basically my my moral compass was being brought into question by how the business was being run, and okay. and I got to a point where I had turned a blind eye to my moral compass. But it got to a point where I was like, this is just wrong, mm. and I need to stop doing it now. So it was, you know, and, and fundamentally we had we had a, a rule in the business because there was three of us. We could always make a, a group decision. And so I, I just decided that I wasn't comfortable with how the other two wanted to run the business. Mm. And I also couldn't see where the business was going to go. Weird story, right? And it sounds like it's made up nonsense, but I decided to do my own podcast. So we did a podcast as the company. Right. And I was I could see the writing was on the wall. There's just some stuff that kept happening. I was like, I'm really uncomfortable here. And my, as I say, my moral compass has always been a bit like, oh, is this all right? Is this not all right? And I turned a blind eye because I wanted to, frankly, call it as it is. But there's just some stuff that was happening. I was like, I just can't. I just can't do this. It's just not the right thing. Mm. Anyway, I've, I started my own podcast because I could see that the writing was on the wall. And my first guest was a guy called Gary Rhodes. And chances are you've never heard of Gary Rhodes. But Gary Rhodes is a very, very successful venture capitalist. And the venture capital, the capital in his venture capitalist world is his own cash. I'm he's, sure, from, yeah. he's from Harrogate. 
He's a, he's keeps a very low profile, but he's around some very successful people, and he's run some very successful businesses. I feel like someone has talk, told me about him before, but anyway, carry on. You, quite possibly, he's a, he's a really <laughs> he's a sort of person. He's like a stealth ninja. You wouldn't know he's involved in stuff. But he's involved in lots of bits and yeah. pieces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, he was he was going to be my first guest on my on my new solo podcast, and I just flown back from South Africa. Um, the day before we're supposed to record this podcast. And he happened to be driving from Italy back home to Harrogate via London to do this podcast. He said, hey, um, hope you're doing good. I'm I've just so happened I've ended up driving quicker than I thought I was going to because he drives like a maniac. Um, I'm back a day early in town. Do you fancy meeting tonight for dinner? And I've just got off this overnight flight from South Africa. I'm like, I'm absolutely shattered. I'm driving back around the, the M25 from Heathrow, back to my house in Chiswurst. I'm like, can I really be asked to go and meet this guy? I don't know him. But something about it was like, just go, just go. So I got home. My wife was away because it was half term with, with our son. So I got home. No one's in the house anyway. Literally unpacked my bag, stuck some stuff in the wash, had a shower, got dressed, went into London to meet Gary Rhodes for this dinner. Never met him before in my life. Did not know anything about the guy. Just knew that I'd been recommended to have him as a podcast guest because he's an incredible guy. Great energy about him. Turn up at this restaurant. Never met him before. I went to this weird restaurant in in, uh, in the West End of London and it's this fancy steak restaurant, fancy French steak restaurant. He's like, we've got to go here. It's amazing. We've got to go here. It's amazing. And on the, res- on the menu is steak and chips or steak or chips. That's it. That's all you have. <laughs> okay. And sauce or no sauce. And there's only one type of sauce. But it's incredible. So I was already like, this is such a weird night. What is going on? Am I jet lagged? What's happening here? Anyway, so we start talking. He's like, so what's, you know, he was, I was talking about the previous business and stuff. And he said, um, he said so what's next for you? What, 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 what do you see coming up around the corner? And I said, do you know what, Gary? I said, it's a really interesting question. I said, because I've been in South Africa for, for six days with my business partner. I've been having this sort of conversation to myself and I've just, it's just not aligning at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm just, I said, frankly, I'm not sure what comes next. We've done really, really well in a short period of time. I don't know what we do next from here. We kind of got a bit stagnant. And he said, um, well, you need to collaborate with other people. He said, based on the brand that you've got, and he said, like, I've, I know some of your stuff and I've watched some of your stuff. It's really good. You need to collaborate with people, other influencers. I said, yeah, yeah, I get it. I said, it makes complete sense. I said, but the problem is that my business partners don't believe in collaboration. They want to do everything by themselves. Mm. And he said, well, my friend, then you've got the wrong business partners, haven't you? And I was like, oh, mm. Gary Rhodes, how dare you over this beautiful steak and chips dinner with the sauce that the waitress has arrogantly thrown onto the steak. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you've sort of told me this. And again, I've known the guy for 15 minutes by this point, And he's like, talk, you know, those people that they don't talk at you they talk into you like he was talking to my soul and i was like oh my god and then so that was the that was the knife then the twist of the knife was this phrase and i will never forget it until the day that i die he said and i was like oh my god yeah i know know. i've I've been thinking this i'm I'm really a a bit sort of disaligned with where the business is going but i don't know how to break up the relationship and i'm really good friends with them we're like family but i know i know it's going to blow up blah 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 and he said look for every day that you don't make a decision that you know ultimately that you should make, I think for every day that you do that, you basically put yourself behind in your own life by a month. So the only question becomes, my friend, how many months behind in your own life would you like to get? Mm. And then he just, beautiful coach moment, he just shut up and he just sat back. And I was like... Oh, <laughs> ah, 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 ah. And, and I made the decision within three days. Because I was like, because every day I was like, I put myself a month behind. I've put myself a month behind. I put myself a month behind. Mm. So that's that's how that that happened. And and literally within, uh, I met him on uh, end of October, and on the fourth of November, I left the business. Mm. That was it. I was, that was me. That was me gone. Had no idea what was coming next. You know, and as I say, you know, I'd upgraded my lifestyle. Had this, you know, made 120 grand, which I, again, when I look back on this in a couple of years' time, I'd be like, ha <laughs> laughable. But that's a lot of dough back then. You know, that was a couple of years ago. I'd, ne- and I'd never made that kind of money before. Moved into this beautiful house, rented this big five-bed house and rented out my flat because it was too small for me. And I had these two cars and had, you know, five, six grand a month's worth of costs and outgoings. And, and literally, as of that minute, stopped the income. Had no Ooh. idea what was coming next, but I just knew in my heart of hearts it was the right thing to do. It was so weird, weird so surreal. You know, and he and Gary Rhodes is business partners with Tony Robbins. So yeah. when he talks, so I think when he talks at you and talks to your soul, there's probably a bit of Tony that's rubbed off on him there. Mm. And it's only after this conversation, which I've realised how you know, how many other businesses that he's involved in and what level of success he's had. But I took him at his word 
as a stranger. And again, I think that was really important because I knew I was making the decision for the right reasons, not because super rich Gary Rhodes told me to, if that makes sense. Yeah, isn't it funny how it can just be the words of a stranger rather than someone you know really well? Yeah, I'd had I'd had multiple conversations with my wife, uh, with my friends, with other people that I was around. And I, and I knew, you know, a lot of my sort of inner circle knew knew of the guys that I worked with and they and they sort of were tr- sort of trying to gently encourage me to exit because I think over the preceding two years I'd not become a different person but I'd become a different version of myself mm. I'm probably not probably not the best version of myself frankly but yeah it was literally was that conversation that moment so that was the Monday night so I go home from this this dinner like my head's spinning like my wife said to me she was like oh, how was dinner I phoned her straight after she was like how was dinner I was like I'm leaving the company she went oh so it was good then. What the hell's happened? And I explained it. She was like, okay. She went, I'm so pleased you made that decision. I didn't want to tell you to do it, but that, yeah. that is the right decision. I'll support you wherever we need to do, but that is the right decision. Yeah. But I sort of went, to, went home that night. And again, because my wife and my son wasn't there. So I came, sort of came back to this big empty house. And I was like, you know, like walking around, going, what's it all about, man? In this old, in this big house by myself, going, what am I doing? What's mm-hmm. life all about? Had a sort of cup of tea. I thought, right. Get your head screwed on straight. You've had one conversation with the guy. Maybe you're making more of a meaning of it than it should be. Maybe you're making the pieces fit because of it's your subconscious is telling you to think these things. Maybe he's not as amazing as you think he is. Let's wait till tomorrow. And I was going back into London the next day to actually interview him. I said, let's just wait and see if he's the real deal tomorrow. Because anyone could be like a mega star for half an hour over <laughs> a fancy dinner. Let's see if he still is the next day. And then the next day I met him and he was even more of a beautiful person than he was the day before. And I was just like... And his wife came to a recording session. I just fell in love with her straight away. They just got like a family energy off them straight away. And I was like, I knew then that I was going to be friends with him for life. Mm-hmm. And I knew that what he was telling me to do was so for the right reasons, even though I didn't really want to hear it. Mm-hmm. it was so bizarre. It really was. It's interesting because if we kind of return to the concept I introduced you to, which is my concept of success without sacrifice concept, it sounds like your journey with that business you know you did seven figures so success right but with sacrifice yeah (laughs) so if we set that as the the kind of bar for success with sacrifice is what you're building now as close to whatever you can you know get you know whatever success without sacrifice do you think like, are you taking the lessons from that and actively choosing? Oh, 100%. 100%. 100% yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of stuff that I did. Um, like I mentioned to you, you know, as soon as there's three months worth of somebody's salary, yeah. sa- you know, we're, we're, I had a conversation with a, with a very, very successful coach earlier on. He's like, where, where are you at in the business right now? And I was like, I was telling him, I was like, oh, it's a bit, I'm a bit frustrated. But I went, mate, he said, you're five months in. He's like, you're exactly where you should be at five months in. Mm. I was like, yeah, but I've done all this sort of stuff before. He said, forget that. He's like, you're starting from scratch in a lockdown, in a pandemic, and you're making money. Like, just chill your, chill your boots, sunshine. You're good. Don't worry about it. You're good. Mm. But but equally, as soon as there's that, that cash for to bring in an employee, the first thing I will do is employ somebody. Mm. P-A-Y-E, employment. I've never done that before. I've always done the polar opposite. I will outsource it. I will automate it. I will systemize it. I'll bring in a freelancer. I will bring in a partner instead of having to do the PAY thing. I don't want to do tax. I don't want to do pension contributions. I don't want to do PAYE. I don't want to do NI, blah, blah, blah. But I know that to get to the next level of success, I need to do things that I've never done before. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. And yeah. ultimately, to your point of success without sacrifice, you know, I've made, financially made a lot of money. But I did it the the hardish way and with people that ultimately, as it transpires in the end, were not good for me to be around. Mm. Whereas now I will operate in a different way. And mm. now rather than being this like soul, you know, hustle porn star, as Stephen Bartlett calls it, you know, the people are like, oh, you've got to hustle your face off. Uh, and I do believe there's an element of that. I will now, I'm trying to be a smarter business person rather than just a harder working business person. Because I know everyone's like, oh, you can't, no one works harder than me. If push comes to shove, you will not outwork me. I will mm. die at a desk before I give up. <laughs> but equally, that is not success if I'm dead. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And so did you, so, when, so you left and you said you didn't really have a plan. You. It looks like from your LinkedIn, from what I can tell, you did some kind of consultancy. Is that right? Yeah, sort of. 
Okay. S- sort of, yeah. So I so I left in the November. Yeah. And then, and I, I we still had sort of ongoing. So it was a it was a coaching business. So we had ongoing clients that were in there for for a year. They, right. they signed up for a year long package, and what I didn't want to do was leave them up shit creek without a paddle. So I said to the lads, look, we've got to work out a way that I can exit this. We've got to find a way that I leave and it looks good for everybody. Okay. I don't want it to be tit for tat. I don't want to be you know, people throwing shit at each other. I said, it's not about that. We started this business as friends. We turned into family and now I'm going. Mm. But we are still family as far as I'm concerned. I said, I know what you like and I know that we can't be friends and that's fine. It makes me breaks my heart, but it is what it is. But we have got to, we have an opportunity here to exit. We've got a very, very good reputation within the marketplace. We've got a very good perception. We've got a very strong brand. If we fall apart now, the brand beneath us falls apart. Mm. But we can leave this situation. You guys end up with 50-50 ownership of it or whatever you want to do. If you want to bring somebody else in, you end up with more of the pie. I end up with none of it, but I've got all the credibility from building this seven-figure business. Let's be sensible about this and do it in the right way. Um, So that was kind of the, the, the first step. And then I wanted to make sure, as I say, with the clients that there was going to be, because a lot of them were, so we were coaching coaches. Right. We had a coaching academy. So I'd written, you know, I think we were on month seven of the syllabus or whatever. So I wrote the final syllabus, you know, the final um, three months worth of syllabuses. And, but then ultimately I was starting to look at, because I'm a a IBQA qualified performance coach and master NLP practitioner, all that stuff. The stuff I was writing as the syllabus the boy the other the other lads didn't use it as part of their coaching methodology so i just phoned i said look i'm happy to write the syllabus but it's not gonna make any sense for you because you guys don't actually use it mm. so I, I can't really do it and that's that's where we really fell out they're like oh we knew you weren't going to fulfill your end of the bargain i said it's not about fulfilling the end of the bargain i said i can't give you something you can't teach to people it's not ethical for me to write a syllabus that you don't understand yeah you got you guys coach based on your intuition your gut but you can't teach people to have a good gut feel. You have to teach them strategies, tactics, hacks, systems, and processes. But you don't mm. understand them. I said, but look, we're never gonna, we're never gonna sort of reach an agreement on this anyway. So think of me what you will. I've done as much as I'm gonna do. I've handed back my shares. I, I have made you buy my stake out. You know, we've got seven things. The accountant said to me, he said you're gonna walk away from this with nothing. I said, I don't care. I just need to be shot of it. I just need mm. to get gone. And he's like, okay, cool. And um, yeah, so then after that. That sort of took about a month. And then I was a bit all at sea. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? And I had, so, and weirdly, because of the, the reputation that we had, I literally, the day that I posted my sort of resignation notice on social media, and I did it in a great way. I, was, I praised them for who they were and what they'd given me and what I'd learned and the, and the structures and the strategies. And I positioned it, I just want to go off and do my own thing. And because I had a big reputation in podcasting, it was easy to go, I just want to focus on podcasting, which I did. Mm. But that wasn't the only reason I left the business. So I did it all the right way. I wrote a beautiful message about him. I tagged him into it. I tagged one of them into it because the other one had blocked me. By this point, it is what it is. I knew that was going to happen. But I put a nice post and everyone's like, you've done that with real class, real decorum, good luck, blah, blah, blah. Great, you know, all the best for what you're doing. I literally had four people message me that same day going, please, can you, before you do anything else by yourself, I need to speak to you to get your help with me. Right. So I had property companies that wanted me to go and help them extend their, they, they had contracts with councils in three or four um, counties. And they wanted me to extend it into the other areas. They wanted me to be going as a marketing director or a brand director or a brand manager. I had so many opportunities. I was like, I don't know what to do. Mm. And my mate, Gary Rhodes, again, who I didn't know, 10, you know, 10 minutes before the steak conversation, said to me, hey, getting on, mate. He said, I saw your post. He said, oh, it's great that you've gone. I think it's the right move for you, blah, blah, blah. You just seem a bit lighter. When I see you on social media, you just seem like lighter. You seem a bit happier. How are you feeling? I was like, yeah, I said, everything's going great. I said, if I'm honest, though, I'm, I'm a bit all at sea. I'm a bit discombobulated. I don't know what's the right move next. I've got so many opportunities. Don't get me wrong. I'm mega grateful to be in receipt of so many options, but I just need to kind of think what's next. Mm. I need to be clever because I can't get the, the next thing wrong. So Gary wrote again, who I've never met before, was like, I'm going to be in Miami for three months. Fancy coming over to Miami? Okay. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, I'm over here with Gary Brecker, who happens to be one of the world's leading human biologists. Um, we're doing some work with him and Grant Cardone. And there's some another gang of cool people who are out here. There's some amazing coaches and some amazing brands, a lot of influencers. Um, Troy Crazy, the certified health nuts, coming over at the weekend to talk about his book launch. I'm helping him with that. Just come and hang out. Be in the conversations. You know, just come and just come and be here. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, maybe I will. So I've got a pregnant wife 
a, a child. I've just left the business and we've got our Australian family turning up for Christmas on the 10th of December. And he says to me on the 3rd of December, come out and spend five days with us. And uh, I got off the phone and this is where I've got probably the world's most incredible wife. Um, everyone thinks that, but I've actually got the most incredible wife. She's like, oh, what, what was Gary saying? And I was like, oh, he said oh, about going to Miami and like hanging out with him and some like some certified health nut or something and some human biologist and Grant Cardone. And, um, and this was a Tuesday night. And she said, well, when did you talk about going? Because we've got family turning up on Saturday, uh, on, on sorry, on the following Monday. I said, I'll be saying go for like, go for the weekend. Go to my, oh, of course, I'm going to go to Miami for the weekend not like, to find myself. And she <laughs> went, you should definitely go. She went, you are no good to anybody here if you can't make a decision. Go, get some space, take some time to turn your phone off, work out what you actually want, just go. And I was like, are you sure? She was like, go, you need to, she said, Gary's the reason or one of the catalysts why you made the biggest decision of your life. One of them, go and just, just hang out. For whatever reason, he's the sort of energy that you should be around, just go. So it was Tuesday night, Thursday afternoon, I flew out to Miami and I thought the whole thing was a blag. I'm like, this is so weird. So I fly, I fly to Miami, get to Miami. Um, even like everything just lined up perfectly. Like the flight that I wanted, I looked on the Tuesday night and it was like a thousand dollars or something. I was like, oh, it's just a bit much to go. I've just stepped away from this business. I'm not, I've got any income. Anyway, the next day I looked on the flights again in the morning. The, fl the flight had dropped by half. Wow. But there was one seat on one flight that was half. And I was like, oh, it's fate, man. It's the universe. So I booked it. <laughs> then I booked the car. And they were like, oh, sorry, the basic cars aren't available. For a £15 upgrade, you can get a convertible Ford Mustang. <laughs> and I was like, click. And I was thinking it was going to be 15 quid a day. But over five days, that's going to add up to a really, I give it to all, I spend the money. But it was $15 for the whole time to have a Mustang convertible. I was like, oh, this has got to be nonsense. So I turn up at Miami Airport with my, with my suitcase, my podcast gear to record these interviews with these interesting people. The guy takes me down to the car park, beep, beep, drop down roof. And the windows go down of this this convertible Mustang. I drove across the Everglades at night with there's like alligators and stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> what is going on, man? But yeah, so I literally, I went and spent this time with, with Gary and I just gave myself space to think. And do you know what the best 10 hours of, of the last two years, probably, other than the birth of my children, got to say that, um, was <laughs> on that flight to Miami because I couldn't be on the internet. Mm. I turned my phone off. I turned the screen in the back of the chair off. And I was like, right, all I'm going to do for the next 10 hours is think. I'm going to plot, and I'm going to plan, and I'm going to think. And that's what I did. I literally like planned what I wanted my next step to be. Um, there's a very successful guy called James Sinclair, who's uh, known as the Millionaire Clown. He owns um, Party Man Group. He owns daycare nurseries, soft play centres, farm parks. He's only, he's only young, 35, 36. Done 100 million quid in sales. Does you know, 15, 10 to 15 million quid a year on an average year. Probably not this year. God love him. Because most of his business is leisure. Mm. He had seen what I've done with the with the previous business. He said, look, I've got a business coaching arm to my company. Come and work with me. And I loved James. I loved what he was about. So when I went to Miami, I was kind of like, do I go and do I be a consultant? And I just do a bit of branding, a bit of podcasting, a bit of coaching. Do I do that for a bit? Or do I go and work with James? And when I sort of weighed it up, the opportunity with James was massive, you know, to be a partner in this company with him. So that's what I did from uh, sort of January till March. And then obviously uh, everything with COVID kicked off. We ended up going home and got put on furlough. And, and it was the second month of furlough. And I was very, don't get me wrong, I was very appreciative of, of you know, the, the furlough money. But realistically, I've gone from a place of the previous year, the same month I'd earned £16,000. Mm. And the furlough check came through and it was for £1,400. Mm. And I literally just said to myself, I can't afford to do this. So I phoned Jim and I just said, look, I love you dearly. Um, I'm mega appreciative, but I can't I can't live on the furlough money. I can't be have my hands tied and not be able to, to earn an income. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to launch the the podcasting agency that I sort of on the plane, I'd undeny, is it podcast agency, consultancy, branding, coaching, or go and work with James. But I just, I wanted to be around him and his energy. So I did that for a bit, but then ultimately, as I say, when, when furlough kicked off, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. So I started the agency in June this year. And mm. even the, even the reason for doing that was interesting. So the furlough check came through and I was like, oh my God, you know, we, our cost of living six grand a month. And I don't say that to go, oh, look how much money I used to earn. And I was like, look how stupid I was just going, oh, just, you know, I'll rent this, I'll buy this car, I'll blah, 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 I'll do all this stuff. 
which is fine when you're cashing in. But when it stops, I was like, oh, shit, right, OK. So I was, you know, four grand short. I luckily had sold a couple of properties. I had a bit of money that I could. So I literally I spent, you know, 40, 50,000 pounds just living this year, just mm. just living and not really making much money. So then the second furlough check came through. I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And I realised that as a, as a podcast coach, I charge 1,500 quid for the day. I was like, well, there's not many people who've got 1,500 quid at the moment for podcast coaching, but there's a win-win here. If I did if I did a 90% discount and did it for 150 pounds, if I had 10 people come to an online training instead of just me doing it one-to-one to one, to one person, I'm making the same day rate, so what do I care? And I get to make help 10 times as many people. Let me test it. So I did. So I put it out on Facebook. I said, hey, I'm going to do this, this online coaching day. It's going to be 150 quid. It's normally 1,500 pounds. Who wants in? And I had nine people sign up straight away. Amazing. So then I did then I did it the next week. And then I did it the week after. I had nine people the first week, seven people the next week, eight people the week after. And after the first day of the lunchtime, I did it in sort of like six hour, I did a six hour session. I had the lunchtime, I sort of stuck my head out the window because it, again, it was like COVID summer lockdowns and my kids were out in the garden playing. And my wife was out there trying to keep them quiet for six hours while I'm on a Zoom call, which is a long time to do a Zoom call. Yeah. And, um, She's like, how's it going? I was like, yeah, it's really good. I said, I'm really enjoying it, actually. I thought I always wanted to do it one-to-one, -one, but actually you can definitely train this in a group. It's really enjoyable. I was like, I've made, I've made 1,250 quid set up here for three hours so far. Mm. I was like, that's mental. She went, yeah, maybe you want to do something about that, dude. <laughs> Instead of like waiting for the furlough money again next month. And I was like, okay, sure. So that's when I went kind of like all in on the podcast agency. Mm. But even, even getting to that point wasn't a straight road. But again, previously I probably would have been very hard on myself or I'd have stuck with, you know, work with the furlough thing for too long. But I've just been, I think this year I've probably learned to be a bit kinder to myself. Mm. Go, okay, well, that hasn't worked out as you wanted it to. But again, it's neither a good nor bad decision, but thinking makes it so. What do you want it to be next? You'll know this as a coach yourself. The main thing in coaching is you've got to put people at cause, not effect. Mm. What's the outcome that, that you want? And as a coach, I say this to people all the time, but I had to sit back and look at it myself and go, right, what's the out? what do I actually want to happen here? Do I want to just sit around on furlough, miserable? Do I want to have to phone the landlords and everyone go, hey, do you mind if we don't pay the rent for a few months? Or do I just want to earn earn my own money mm. and double down on that? And my wife launched a business during lockdown as well. And, yeah. and we've done we've done great so far. You know, we're not at the we're not at the seven figure stage yet, but for for two people who are raising two children in a house when you can't go out and trying to sort of juggle family life and businesses, we've we've done all right. So, wow, well, I'm glad you didn't ask me that as the quick fire round. He says <laughs> half an hour later, pausing for breath. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, do you know, I love talking to you because every time you answer, it brings me up a new question. It's very easy. To, <laughs> I've not even looked in my list of questions yet. <laughs> um well i am actually there's, there's there, yeah there are a couple of things i do actually want to ask you from my list but just on that point so your wife starts a business and you've got two kids how on earth do you balance looking after the kids versus we've both got these two new startups like do you have a routine or like a schedule or how yeah. does that even work so, so we're really lucky that Haley's mum and dad are the most wonderful people you could ever hope to meet Okay. And my son, Louis, who's three and a half, he, he loves nanny and grand, like loves nanny and granddad. Um, if he could, he would live with nanny and granddad full time because they're a lot more fun than mummy and daddy, <laughs> which, is what, which is what nanny and granddad are supposed to be about. Yeah. But luckily, when we, we, we had to pull him out of nursery because my wife was pregnant during COVID. Right. And he was obviously going to nursery and we were really worried about it. So we pulled him out of nursery. But he, had, but he was thriving in nursery. He was getting so much interaction with kids and all that sort of stuff. So we had him at home by ourselves for 12 weeks, didn't go out. My wife, literally, she didn't go out for five months. Wow. Said pregnant people, you know, especially remember at the start, they didn't know what it was or how you kept caught it and all this sort of stuff. And um, so to start with, it was really challenging. But as this sort of the COVID thing, as we had our second baby and lockdown number one eased up a bit we were able to let him go and see nanny and granddad so they became part of our like support bubble okay. so he goes there two days a week um i so, and on those two days we you know sort of juggle it you know one of our other ones 12 weeks old and you don't have to do much with a 12 week old they sleep in a chair or they sleep in their cot or they do mm. a bit of tummy time and they roll around the floor they don't need much. You think as a first time parent, you're like, I've just got to stare at this little thing the whole time, or like, I've got to try and play him some classical music or read him 15 books. Like, they just don't give a shit. They'll just sit there and just like <laughs> play with, you know, sit in their bouncy chair and play with like a giraffe and an elephant for an hour. They're quite happy. So mm -hmm. on the days when Louis's out, we sort of like just just juggle it. And then one day, one like half day a week, I'll take the kids. 
and I'll take them out so my wife has time to, to sort of work. But equally, if she's got meetings with her clients or whatever, I just sort of jump off what I'm doing and just jump on what she's doing. We kind of just check each other's calendars once a, once a week, mm. double check what we're doing, and we just kind of pass the laptops and pass the babies kind of thing. Yeah, okay, cool. No, it's... um. Yeah, I mean, I I've, don't have kids myself, so I'm just I just find it really interesting. How it's, it's, it's how. a challenge. <laughs> it, it is a challenge, but, but, but under no stretch of the imagination, it is a challenge. Yeah. But it's a very enjoyable challenge. Yeah. You know, our, 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 we we love what we do, and again, that was another conversation that we had. We 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 saw some mates. We did like a Zoom. Uh, barbecue with some of our mates during lockdown and one of our friend's wives couldn't work so she had gone mm. to universal credit okay she's wow. a hairdresser because that's the only thing she could she hasn't got any other not in a derogatory way she hasn't got any other skill sets other than physical and obviously you weren't allowed to touch other people because they might kill you mm. so she went on to universal credit and i think she was getting something like 185 quid a month oh my god and and i remember Haley saying to me she's like like what what do we do like the furloughs covering 1500 quid up to like maybe say a couple of grand because don't forget like furlough but it was two two and a half grand maximum so even that if we'd got the maximum furlough for my job we still would have been under half underwater from what the the cost of living was mm. and we sort of thought well we're not going to do the we're not going to do the furlough thing we're definitely not going to do the universal credit thing and um and i remember my wife saying to me she's like well universal credit doesn't pay very well does it she went do you know what? Fuck that. Let's just earn. Let's just earn the money instead. Mm. And I was like, "What do you mean?" She went, "Well, I, she went, I can take on more website clients. I can take on more branding clients. I can take on more graphics clients." She went, "Fuck that. We're gonna. We'll save ourselves. No one's coming to save us. We'll save ourselves." Love it. And so, and so, literally from that point on, we've just literally sort of just juggled. Uh, my wife's got a, we've got a design agency called Orange Lamb, and she's amazing at what she does. And she, you know, she gets word of mouth recommendation after word of mouth recommendation. So she's never been without work since she started because every time she finishes a project, whoever she's done the project for recommends the next piece of work. Yeah. Um, which is great. And it's the same for the podcast agency. So we kind of, um, yeah, just made that commitment to kind of, I guess, save ourselves and then just knew that it was going to be a bit tricky for the for the first year until we could get the boys back into nursery. Mm. And we just make do. And then, you know, we put them to bed. We're really lucky. Little one. He's a really good sleeper. So he goes to bed at seven o'clock and we'll sleep through till 11 when he needs another bottle of milk. So we sort of juggle kids in the daytime and juggle laptops in the daytime based on who's got the most important thing to do yeah. um, or the most time pressing thing to do. Put both the boys to bed by seven o'clock. Then we go downstairs, have a cup of tea, have a quick catch up. They get our laptops out and we work till half nine, ten o'clock. Watch an episode of Crown, go to bed, start the day again. <laughs> Done. <laughs> amazing well, it sounds like it's working for you it is um, at the moment yeah it's, it's a juggling act though it is a juggling act for sure yeah so when you launched your podcast did you know what you were doing like did you have a plan like this is how I'm going to grow it this is how I'm going to get for, like audience members like did you you knew what you, you were doing yeah so so in 2010 I was on the I was on the radio so I, I was on a digital radio station called Amazing Radio. It was my dream, right. sort of from 2006 to 2010, I was like, I want to be on the radio because I worked in radio PR. So I worked with BMW, Nando's, Nissan, Thomas Cook, all those sort of like big companies. And I helped them to get on the radio, but I really wanted to be a presenter. So in 2010, I, I ended up getting a gig on the radio. I was like, this is it. This is my golden ticket to celebrity, stardom and all the rest of it. But they bought in this, this new head of music who was an ex-Radio 1 bigwig. And he's like... I'm going to make sweeping changes at this station. I was like, this is great. He's going to come in and he's going to change everything. Unfortunately, his first sweeping change was to sack me and my mate from our oh, show. And I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. So that sort of, that dream finished almost. And from 2010 to 2017, I didn't really do anything in the broadcast space. I worked in the music industry. I helped bands and record labels to, to secure um, airtime and coverage and stuff. So I was still around the radio game, but I wasn't on the radio. And then in 2017, a mate of mine said, when are you going to actually do this? And I fell in love with podcasts in 2012. Okay. And I kept saying, oh, I, should do, I should do a podcast. I should do a podcast. I should do a podcast. And a mate of mine said, well, when are you actually going to start doing this? You keep talking about it. You've got all this history and heritage in broadcast and radio. When are you going to get out your own way and just start? And I was like, uh, well, I'm not really sure. And he's like, I'll tell you what. And he was a big deal in the sort of the, the fitness and the health space. He was a bit of like an influencer. He said, I'll tell you what. And he was a coach. Uh, he's like, I tell you what, you should do it. And if you do do it, I'll be your first guest. I don't do interviews anymore. He'd been a former champion boxer. So he'd done stuff with like Sky and the BBC and stuff. He said, I don't really do interviews anymore. But if you do this podcast, I'll be your first guest. But here's the deal. You've got 30 days to get it launched. 
If you do, I'll be my first. I'll be your first guest. If you don't, I'll call you out on Facebook and social media. I'll tell everyone that you're a bullshit artist and that everything that you say about business and branding is null and void because you don't take any action on the advice that you give people. I was like, okay, bit bit savage, but fair enough. So within 30 days, I launched this podcast and I sat and I, I listened to a podcast called How to Launch a Podcast Podcast by right. John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know, yeah. And um, and I listened to that podcast and then I, and I took the branding and the marketing and the PR expertise that I'd sort of accumulated over a decade, bolted that onto what I was listening to in this podcast. I was like, oh, I wonder if that would work, actually. So the day that I launched it back in March, I think it was March the 27th, 2017, Tim Ferriss was number one, I was number two, and Gary Vee was number three. I was like, oh, that worked out quite well. And then from that point onwards, I was like, then I then I launched a, a podcast for my coaching business, the one that did seven figures, and that went into the iTunes top charts as well. I was like, oh, this works, doesn't it? So I sort of systemized it and tweaked the process. And now, fast forward to today, I've launched 129 podcasts for clients with 85 to 90% of them going into the iTunes top charts because I've got this systemized process. So yeah, when I launched my latest podcast, I knew I knew what to do, but I didn't the first time. I just sort of cobbled it together, basically. Mm, I hadn't I hadn't realized that you'd had multiple podcasts, actually. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I so thought... I had one in 2017 called Standouts, and it was literally right. me having people, conversations with people who stand out from the crowd. That was kind right. of what I wanted to do. And then I got busy running the coaching business, so I stopped that and I had the coaching business podcast instead yeah and then i launched a uh then i worked with a a mount everest explorer i helped him to launch his podcast and that went into the top 50 podcasts as well and then people because we were coaching people um they were like oh well you know media and social media and marketing your your coaching business was one of the big things we talked about so podcasting played a role in that so i started teaching those people so yeah i i had i've had three of my own shows right and i've now launched yeah 129 shows as of last week it's amazing especially <laughs> especially because it's been it's been only like a business since say june june 2020 so yeah so i mean the, the 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 launch of those podcasts has been since 2017 so that's been over like three or four three okay. years i, I was guess say, you must have been working very hard oh no yeah so since june we've probably, <laughs> probably done i don't know a couple of dozen Ooh. podcasts since since june okay because i would i've been coaching people on the side really it was never my full-time focus or gig really mm. so uh but yeah since june has been this this business yeah okay and i saw on your instagram that you're going to do a, a video talking about like what how you get in the itunes top 10 so yeah. i don't suppose you'd mind sharing a little sneak preview of what you're going to be doing at the weekend <laughs> I can't, I can't, because because <laughs> otherwise you you might leak it to the to the media. <laughs> yeah, so basically, I I tune, um, sorry, I tune, Apple Podcasts for the first time ever have come out and said what they actually look for for a show to enter the charts. Yeah. Now us podcasters and us sort of teachers of podcasting have always had to guesstimate it, and because I've done one hundred and thirty ish shows, I've got a good level of data to go. Well, that kind of worked. Why did that work? Why didn't that work? So I've kind of cobbled together this system, which I think is based on what the algorithm is looking for. Right. But now they've actually come out and said what they're looking for. So rather than it being like best guess, it's actually based on fact. So they're basically looking at the interaction that your that your account gets All right. over, over a, a, a period of time. And they're looking at, um, so number of downloads, number of, of in- engagements, and then what they called um uh what do they call it playback playback engagement or something like that so effectively they're looking for how much of a show do people listen to okay on yeah. playback consumption levels that's right they call it payback consumption levels so the big thing has always been get loads of people to download your show on day one do ratings and reviews and all that kind of stuff that might help the algorithm because again we've had to guess yeah. you know um putting you know keywords in the uh mp3 show name might help putting mp3 keywords in the show title might help in the episode title might help all these seo hacks and they and i still think they do play a bit of a role but yeah so this playback thing is really important because not only is it like how many people can you get to download your podcast but how much of it do they listen to is really important because there's loads of these like um sort of um 
like bot companies or you know the people that have got you know they used to have it for instagram and they get like a million people to be like oh i like your photo just automated yeah. they've got the same thing now for podcasting where these bots will download the podcast yeah. but because they're not listening to the podcast that's why the bots don't actually work right okay so that's that's the main thing but in terms of what i always coach people on is there's a two-week promo process to, to leading up to your podcast so you turn your cold market warm and hot so mm. they're ready for the launch of it and then when you launch you launch with three shows so you launch with a pilot episode yeah. and two full-length shows and actually the pilot episode was something that i kind of come up with the content i was like i think this would work but now that playback uh, quantity or whatever it makes sense why the pilot show works because it's between five and 15 minutes so most people are going to get through that entire show mm. so itunes you go look at it and go okay they've had a lot of engagement on the account they've had downloads on the account and everyone's listened to episode one it must be good that's why all of my shows have ranked mm. so i've basically given you away my top tips now no one needs my coaching so thank you for ruining <laughs> that business for me <laughs> so <I> was- <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so do you recommend then that people have like a large audience before they start and meet like what's you absolutely don't need to have one okay. by any stretch of the imagination don't get me wrong if you've got an audience if you can activate that audience to do stuff yeah then, then that's great however i saw an influencer uh she's a, like a business coach you know course launch expert ironically she's actually done a course about podcasting even though she's never launched her own podcast no and worries. still didn't because she had another agency do it for her but she got to like number 25 Mm. I was like, that's that's not good enough based on your numbers because she didn't she didn't have a systemized process. So no, you don't need a following. Of course, okay. it can help like anything. You know, it helps to launch courses, books, podcasts, anything. If you can, if you've got a, an engaged flag waving sort of advocates of your brand that will do anything for you for sure. Yeah. But I've the system and the strategy that I created and sort of bolted on stuff too, and I'm still always tweaking it and changing it. I've made it work from the word go that you could use your organic social media following to make your show bounce into the charts without needing to have a hundred thousand people on a mailing list Mm, okay well that's reassuring for a lot of people i'm sure and when i started mine i i mean i had a okay sized audience but nothing to shout about so (laughs) to be honest well the podcast should be used as a way to build an audience you know the best credibility tools out there you know i get messages all the time so i do um, sort of weekly in-depth interviews with people about, you know, people are building exciting brands and businesses. My show's called Building the Brand. Yeah. And I've spoken to like um, Rob Law MBE, the guy who invented the trunky suitcase, and Daniel Gray, who's created the world's fastest growing male makeup brand. Um, I've Jamie Alderton, the fitness guru guy, Brad Burton, the UK's number one motivational speaker, Joseph Valente, who won The Apprentice. So I've spoken to some really cool people. And um, I can't remember where I was going with that. I think I was just bragging. Was I just bragging? No, there was a purpose for that, wasn't there? Um, but yeah, but when I started, I didn't have any sort of level of following to to utilize those guests with, if that makes sense. But I just knew mm. that that was the, the angle that I wanted to, to go down. What was your question? Because I've completely thrown myself. Um, well, we're talking about audience size. And yeah, you were saying that you didn't need. I've gone. No, you didn't need. Gone. No, completely okay. gone. <laughs> but no, the answer is no, you don't need a big audience. You exactly. don't need a big audience at um, all. So. I mean, yeah, you, you've had some very impressive people on. So if you've not got a big audience, can you get impressive people on? Like what's what's that conversation that needs to be had? 100%. Don't forget, everybody starts from somewhere. Mm. So, I, you know, now I find it easier to get guests on because I can go, hey, I'm known as the podcast king. I've got, you know, top 50 show and I've had, you know, I've helped. You know, I've had thousands of downloads and millions of listeners and blah, 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 and all this stuff. But I yeah. started from scratch, from nowhere. So what I would do is look at your inner circle to start with. Who do you know, like, and trust? Who's, you know, who are your LinkedIn first connections? Mm. Who could you reach out to and, you know, get somebody like that on board? But equally, what I do is, I, I, and I say this to people all the time, is I sell people on the vision of what it's going to be. So I sell them on the vision, like standouts. When I launched that in 2017, I didn't, you know, I'd never recorded a podcast ever. The standouts are going to be, conversations about the inspirations aspirations and motivations of people who stand out in their field like i can remember it that well because i cut it kind of just like came to me one day i was like that's what it should be about so i sold people on that vision i created a one page this is what the podcast is going to be about you know we're going to be in the business category alongside the likes of tony robbins and grant cardone and blah 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 didn't never mention that of anything about them other than we're going to be in the same category as them so i <laughs> sold them i sold people on the vision of it 
And if you sell people on the vision of it, then I think that's what they buy into first and foremost. And then when you get a couple of successes, which is why the launch part of the process of launching your podcast is so important, which mm. is why I work with all of my clients, this 14-day promo process we talked about a minute ago, that's the bit that will make or break your podcast. Mm. You can have the best podcast in the world, but if you don't do the promo bit right, no one's going to ever hear it. Okay. Unless you chuck a thousand quid at, you know, ads every single day. But even still, I don't reckon that gains that much engagement. Mm. Um, so that that's what's really really important is to is to get that audience there from day one utilizing that that promo process and then once you've done that once you become an itunes top podcaster which there is a way to to hack the system we talked about a minute ago you know what apple are looking for yeah as soon as that happens tweak that one pager hey i'd love you to come on my show as an itunes top 50 podcast in the business category and most of my shows i can get them to rank because i put them in I, I, the back end system i build out in the right way so i can get them to rank in one or two top line categories and up to three subcategories as well mm. go, hey my po- podcast is a top 50 business podcast it's a top 20 new business podcast it's a top 50 marketing podcast which was what mine was uh, it was also a top um, education podcast a top, top self-improvement podcast how would you like to come on my show that's got loads of credibility but i got the initial guests from my inner circle launched it the right way and then had the credibility then i used the credibility to get other people to buy into it and then mm. you can then spin those other people so like daniel gray from war paint and joseph valente and rob law mbe etc cetera, etc cetera. i can now utilize that to get the next lot of guests yeah um, i've just just yesterday literally jake humphreys from BT Sport, and he's got an amazing podcast called High Performance. He messaged yeah. me on Instagram because I, I literally I, had I literally posted on Instagram about him today, and he wrote, re- reposted me, and I was so excited. <laughs> he's he's a lovely fella. He's I've sort of posted about it a couple of times. I've and I've uh, Damien, who he does the Professor yeah. Damien, who does the podcast with. Yeah, I've, I've had a bit of back and forth with him, and he messaged me yesterday. So I'm really sorry. I've seen posted about me about the show a couple of times. Uh, what's the best email address i'll give it to uh, my pa and we'll make it happen in january but now i've got that credibility because i can go to people like that and can go oh i've had joseph valenta blah blah but yeah. you, you don't have any credibility to start with so you have to sell people on the vision to start with mm. then get a couple of quick wins and then resell them on the wins mm. yeah i love it um <clears throat> i had another question but i've forgotten about it what was i gonna oh, say oh thank god you've done it as well i felt really <laughs> bad you one all <laughs> oh dear what was i gonna say well, there's, a, there's an observation that I've made and I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this as like a final question. But um, so one thing I've, um, yeah, really appreciated since interviewing people on the podcast and, you know, as you know, I'm, you know, I'm going after really successful people who are, yeah, you know, achieving seven figures and onwards. And one thing I've noticed is that they either have a personal brand or they don't. And like they either really have a personal brand, so like, you know, tw- like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers, or like they don't ever go on social media. And I thought it was interesting what you were saying about Gary Rhodes, how, you know, you might not know who he is, but he's this crazy successful people that works with Tony Robbins. He's obviously very famous. And why do you think some people want to build a brand and other people don't? I think it probably comes down to your personal values. So I've I've got another mate of mine, a guy called Andy. I won't give away his full name, but he's worth like 30 million quid. And he, he lends out, he's a money lender. He, he lends out, he does what's called bridging finance. So he, he bridges property deals. So if you can't get a mortgage on a property because it's not like up to mortgageable standards or whatever, you use a bridging loan. But he bridges really dodgy stuff. So for example, if company, if there's like a, what's he bridged when I last spoke to him? He he'd bridged um, uh, a gigantic church in North London. He had bridged um, a huge shopping centre in Wales. He had uh, a cinema complex. So he bridges stuff that's on the edge. So it's always a risk that he won't get the money back, if that makes sense. Yeah, but he's yeah. got 25 million quid out on the street at any given point in time working for him. Yeah. Mega successful guy. Does not have an Instagram account. Doesn't mm-hmm. have a LinkedIn account. Couldn't care less. And when I got into the property space, you know, in sort of 2013, I got mega excited. I was like, Andy, there's all these people out there who want to use bridging finance, dude. And I think I could bring some of them to you. You need to get on social media. We need to do some branding. But I went, Jim. He always used to call me Jim. I went, Jim, Jim, Jim. People come to me when they need the money, not want the money. Mm-hmm. With respect, dude. He said, I don't need to go to networking events. I don't need to do branding. I don't need a website. People have my phone number. They phone me up. 
I'll put it through my legal team, see if I can assess the deal, whether it stacks up or not, and I'll either lend them the money or not. I do it at 60 to 40 loan to value, so I have to have a good chunk of skin in the game themselves, and I charge 2% a month. I'm expensive. I've got 25 million quid out in the street at the moment working for me. I just don't need to do it, dude. Mm. I'd rather have a quiet life. Mm. I was like, fair enough. So there's people that are, so I, so I think there's some people that are just get busy doing the do. Mm-hmm. and making the money and there's other people that want the spotlight that want mm-hmm. the adulation you know don't get me wrong like a podcast that we're doing right now it's gonna be great for both of our brands it's good it's good for you know you can leverage my brand i can leverage your brand etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah but there's an element of you know we both want to be famous in our space for our thing mm-hmm. but other people just not interested in it but i genuinely believe that personal brand is the fastest way to grow a business brand yeah i think a business brand takes a decade a bit a personal brand takes months mm. once you know your core values your usps your mission statement your value proposition all that stuff and you've got a message con- con- constant consistent oh so maybe consistent it's more important consistent message that you can push out on a daily basis yeah. then that's what can build your personal brand but it's mm. just it comes i think it comes down to personal preference mm. but the other thing that people got to understand is that you are consciously or subconsciously everyone's building a brand so yeah. if you're like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't build a brand. I don't need to build a brand. But you're on Facebook and you're posting about your family at the weekends. Then you're a family man, family woman. Yeah. That's mm. the brand positioning that people have in your mind. Your brand is your reputation. Yeah. Your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So you can't control that. But you can curate the narrative by what you show people. Mm. Gosh, yeah, okay. I feel like if I ask, yeah, I'm not going to ask any more questions because it's going to open a can of worms and I want to respect your time. I've already gone over. Um, but yeah. I just heard my three year old get home as well. He's just gone, Daddy. I'm like, No, don't ruin a podcast. He's going to probably bowl in here any given second with the Thomas the He's like, Look what I've got. Oh, he can give us a millionaire secret if you like. <laughs> so you want my millionaire secret? Yeah, I want to know. It's the final question I always ask. Um, yeah, I want to know what's your millionaire secret. Take some form of action every single day that gets you 1% closer to the outcome you're chasing. Mm. The, the law of attraction, I love it as a concept. The secret, interesting book. The greatest secret that I'm reading at the moment, the, the, the follow-up to it by Rhonda Byrne, equally interesting book. But sitting there with post-it notes all around your mirror going, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, is going to get you sweet fuck all. It's mm. going to get you nothing. So I would say have a positive mindset have a glass half full kind of mentality and then take some form of action on a daily basis mm. the, the law of attraction is a great concept but the law of action is what will get you the results ultimately and you can do it in a way where you don't have to suffer for your success you can just enjoy the whole process <laughs> you said that so convincingly <laughs> i'm not sure it's true but i hope it is <laughs> uh do you know what this has been amazing and yeah i mean i could have filled up another hour with all the questions that i had lined up but i've really really enjoyed it i've got to say i do a, obviously i do a lot of podcast coaching and i've been on a lot of podcasts and i've done a lot of podcast episodes you are a fantastic podcast host oh bless fantastic. you fantastic your your questions are brilliant the fact that you'll come back at certain stuff is brilliant you give the guests space and room to give their complete answer I, 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 it's genuinely been one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've, I've ever done. I, I've oh my loved gosh, it. wow, I've that's amazing. It. Thank you. I feel like you batted me over the head for the first half an hour, but I enjoyed it. I did enjoy well, it. <laughs> I need to get you in a weak and vulnerable state so that I can... Yeah, you definitely did. You totally <laughs> robbed me. You did it for like, for long enough and in, intense enough that then I was broken and I was going to tell you all my secrets about why I'm so fragile. <laughs> yeah that now you figured out my secret <laughs> but no thank you so much um it's been an absolute pleasure spending this time with you and yeah. thanks so much for joining us on this episode and this is the one secret that i really want you to share so if you know someone who just you know needs to hear this message of inspiration please share this episode with them and if you enjoyed what you heard today i would be super grateful if you could leave me a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on If you would like to subscribe to receive email notifications when a new episode comes out, then you can visit millionairesecretspodcast.com and we'll be very grateful to have you on our email list. So thank you again for listening to Millionaire Secrets or watching if you're on YouTube. And don't forget, knowledge is only power when you take action on it. I don't want the secrets in this podcast to stay secret for long. So go away, implement the advice given and let me know your results. 
Take care and I'll see you soon.